My name is Peter Fischer. I'm a quantitative geneticist from the University of Queensland. And I got some very um, clear instructions from the organizers. I either have to give a research talk or a tutorial or both. And of course, I'm going to do none of the above. <laughs> so what I'm uh, trying to do is actually give you a bit of a mix of a tutorial and a research talk. Now, before I do that, I'd like to invite all of you to come to Brisbane uh, next year, June, where we're hosting the International Congress of Quantitative Genetics. That's a wonderful conference which brings together people from different disciplines where, that you think might be completely separate. People working in model species, in trees and crops and livestock, human disease and human traits, genetics in individual cells, theory and methods, which is of course a topic uh, uh, today and, and this week. And um, if you want to know more about this conference, we'll be um, offering uh, uh, travel scholarships, etc. Talk to Naomi Ray, who's over there, who's the chair of the meeting. So this is the outline of my talk. And if you perceive that the slides are somewhat not centered, so they're to the right, it's because I changed them all today um, because this, all, this thing here gives a new meaning to the word black box. <laughs> anyway, I'll do my best. So I'll give you a start with a brief overview of uh, quantitative genetics, which is my field of research. Then a little bit about GWAS and genetic architecture. And then the main, the main topic, which is trying to estimate genetic variants uh, in human complex trait from uh, data generated from genome-wide association studies. And finally, just because it's fun, some comments about uh, prediction of traits, in particular human, uh, human height and where that's going. I arbitrarily start uh, the field uh, or, 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 or start my talk in 1886. Uh, this is a paper uh, from Francis Galton, one of those Victorian polymaths. And what uh, the researchers at that time were doing were using the newly developed uh, techniques of regression and correlation to look at the similarity or the resemblance between relatives. In this case, it's for human height. <clears throat> and what's plotted here on the y-axis is the height of children against the average of their parents, the midparental va uh, value. And as you can see from these plots here, these are the means. Uh, there is a regression towards the mean, or, as Galton called it, regression towards mediocrity. And he was very concerned about that, not just for height, but also for other traits like intelligence. And we can think about this as a shrinkage here. We now know, and that's the uh, theory developed much later, that under a number of assumptions, the slope of this line is actually an estimate of heritability, which is the uh, total amount of uh, phenotypic variation that we observe that's um, um, caused by uh, unknown genetic factors. I also believe that Galton was the first one to apply a linear mixed model in a prediction sense because he built in this paper a prototype for a statue, statue forecaster. Don't ask me how this works, but I do understand the equation, I think, a bit better. At least I hope I wrote it down correctly. The phenotype, so that's a predict predicted value of the height of a son or daughter. Uh, it's got an overall mean, some dummy variable for the sex of the, of, the, of the child, the effect of sex, and then this shrinkage factor here, which is the parent average minus the population mean. And here's this factor of two thirds. So you've seen it here uh, for the first time, a uh, uh, linear mixed model in 1886. At that time, others, of course, started to play with the same uh, correlation and, 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 um, um, and regression uh, uh, techniques. And this is a paper from 1903 from Pearson and Lee. And as you can see, they plotted here the distribution of height. It's quite a large sample even at that time. So a nice normal distribution and a nice linearity in the in the correlation, in this case, between sons and their fathers. And I've summarized for you here the uh, observed phenotypic correlations. Uh, from f These are all first degree relatives here. And they're all about 0.5, as you can see, and small standard errors, large sample sizes. 
And you can also observe there's a correlation there between spouses and uh, about 0.28. And interestingly, that hasn't really changed all that much since then. And, and, and uh, we attribute this to uh, assortative mating, and it's one of the things that Noah talked about in a previous talk. So around that time, there's this heated debate. If you think there are vigorous debates in the literature now, you go back to, uh, to the early 18, 1900s and the late 1800s. Vicious. Okay, so I call this the height versus P debate. And the question was, so I have, uh, sorry, the black box is obscuring uh, what's, what I term as the biometricians. So that's the Galtons and Pearsons on, on the one hand versus the Mendelians, because Mendel's laws were rediscovered in 1900, um, where of course these are, uh, the phenotypes there uh, behave like the segregation of single genes. And the question was whether quantitative traits like height have the same hereditary and evolutionary properties as discrete characters like Mendel's P's. And it wasn't really until 1918, which is the real foundation paper, uh, in my opinion, of quantitative genetics, when Ronald Fisher reconciled these two different views by sim simply proposing that underlying traits like height, there are multiple genetic factors that each, each behave in a Mendelian fashion. And, and, and just if you're interested, this is the, the paper that first introduced the word variance and also essentially uh, derived in this an analysis of variance that we're, that we're using a lot uh, of, in different fields of, of science and, and, and research, of course. So what did, okay, this was supposed to be a, okay, don't know what's happened here. But, um, so what Fisher essentially proposed, uh, first of all, to explain the normal distribution we see for, for a height, was to say, here we have, by the way, on the x-axis here, from left to right, you can think about it as the number of increasing alleles. He said, if we have one gene and it has a certain effect, then we find this distribution of phenotypes in the population. If we go to two genes, we have nine genotypes and five phenotypes, if they have the same effect size each. And as you can see very quickly, when we're at, 80, uh, when we're at four genes, you already see the resemblance of a normal distribution. The second thing he did in his paper was actually quantify the covariance between relatives for a trait as just a function of the genes they share identical by descent and variance components. And that was really the major breakthrough in this paper. So here we have the genetic covariance between two individuals. It's a function of additive genetic variance and the relationship between individuals. This is the probability of sharing an allele identical by descent. And he also dealt with dominance variance, which is to do the probability of you sharing a genotype identical by descent. And the beauty of this uh, formulation here is that we can turn this around. We can observe the resemblance between relatives or the correlation between relatives and from that estimate genetic variance in the population, which is quite remarkable because it doesn't tell us anything about the genes uh, how many genes are segregating in the population, what the effect size is, we can still estimate the genetic variance. So let's look uh, again at my favorite trait, which is a model trait, uh, human height. Let's look over time at the correlation between, uh, between relatives. So here we have just a simple phenotypic correlation. And here I have all different relatives that are all first degree relatives. Yeah, so they're all a halves in terms of relationship. And these, this is Pearson and Lee again, and these are other more contemporary data sets. And as you can see, for all these relatives, the correlations are pretty constant. They're about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 or so for human height. And again, in the UK Biobank, if we did this, we found exactly the same. And when we estimate genetic variance or heritability, we like to look at different relatives, also to try to tease apart the influence of the environment. And here we have a phenotypic correlation for height for different kinds of relatives here on, on this axis here, where ones are identical twins, halves are these guys on the left side here, and quarters are, for example, uh, grandparent, grandchild, or half siblings. And you can see this nice linearity. And again, under some assumptions, you can interpret the slope of this line, which in this plot is three quarters, as an estimate of heritability.
We can also go to standard twin design. This is from my colleagues at QIMR, Queensland Institute of Medical Research in Brisbane. Uh, male identical twins, just plotted simply the correlation here, 12, nearly 1200 MZ pairs, correlation 0.85 and 0.45 for male non-identical twins. And under again, under some assumptions about uh, the influence of uh, common environmental factors, we can take twice the difference between them and, and uh, lo and behold, it gives an estimate of 0.8. We don't have to look just at height. This is some data from um, uh, contemporary data from Swedish brothers, from mostly from um, uh, eighteen-year-olds when they um, had their testing for the um, for the army, and and this is looking at a bunch of traits, including height, but also more socio-economic um, um, traits almost, um, and 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 social sciences traits like years of schooling and so on. Here on the left, I have identical twins, and we're going all the way to um, adoptees and, and half sips over here. And there's a few things just to note here. First of all, there is a relationship that the further away you go in, in, in the proportion of genes you share, uh, the lower the correlation, which is consistent with genetic variation. But there's also clear evidence of the effect of the environment, because, for example, uh, all these three groups over here, uh, non-identical twins, full sips that um, were raised together and full sips that are raised apart share the same proportion of genes, but their correlation goes down, which would be consistent with the effect of, of, of shared environment, for example, and the same for adoptees. So, of course, this, this, this whole week is about genomics, and in a genomic era, what we're interested in is to um, uh, attribute the genetic variation that we can estimate from the resemblance between relatives to individual uh, genes and individual mutations and polymer polymorphisms at individual loci. And this is just to remind ourselves that the contribution of a particular polymorphism or mutation to variance in the population is a function of two things. Gene frequency, how common this variant is in the population, and the effect size. And by effect size, what I mean here is this is sometimes called the average effect of a gene substitution. This actually goes back to the Fisher 1918 paper. And you can think about it as a regression of the genotypic value at that locus on SNP dosage, or, or, or locus doses in this case, the number of big B alleles. By the way, this kind of regression that we do is exactly the same as what we do in GWAS when we, when we do a standard genome-wide association study for a quantitative trait. So all points on this line, all uh, loci on those, this line, explain or contribute exactly the same of uh, genetic variance and therefore phenotypic variation in a population. And you might think this is kind of artificial because it goes all the way from super rare to super common. There are actually examples of, of genes we, or mutations we already know about that fit on the extremes of this curve. So the first one is, and you will surely recognize this gene name by now because it was mentioned by uh, Lisa uh, this morning. This is the Fibrillin, Fibrillin 1 gene and, and mutations in this gene uh, cause uh, Marvin syndrome as, as we heard. Um, under some assumptions, some of these mutations have frequencies of the order of 1 in 5,000. Or this could also be cumulative, um, uh, the cumulative mutation, but it doesn't matter. The effect size actually is very large. It has an effect, apart from all the, the clinical phenotypes that Lisa showed this morning, the effect size on height is that it increases height by of the order of 4 inches or so, 10 centimeters. So a very large effect, but very rare. And here at the other end is one of the loci uh, where a SNP was uh, first found by GWAS, which uh, was robustly associated with height. Very common in the population, minor allele frequency of 35%, but the effect size is tiny, only a few, uh, a few millimeters, whatever that is, a fraction of an inch. And these can, under those assumptions, both explain about 0.7% um, of the variance, of, uh, of the phenotypic variance. So I didn't know when I, when I started, uh, when we came here, how many of, of you knew um, what a GWAS was, and uh, several uh, other speakers have mentioned it, but can we 
please raise hands if somebody doesn't know what a genome-wide associa association study is. Good. Okay, well, I can skip. Well, I won't skip this. All, all I want to say is that, that what brought, uh, what, what's important for this, uh, this presentation is that it requires the, and what's crucial underlying uh, GWAS, in fact, it's a scientific basis of GWAS, is a correlation structure between variants in the genome, uh, also called linkage equilibrium. And that means that we don't have to do whole genome sequencing if we're interested in common variation, although there are 10, 15 million common variants in, 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 in uh, uh, samples from, uh, with European ancestry, we only have to genotype about 500,000 of them, if they're well chosen, to capture most of that variation. So it's a really efficient design. And, and this is just showing that uh, what this design does is, is in terms of, 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 um, of the experiment, is extremely simple. We have for disease some cases and controls, and all we do is looking for frequency differences across all the, all the markers that we test. And then we have one of these typical plots where we have the strength of association here against, against the chromosome position. And just in case you haven't seen this, I hope this is going to work. This is supposed to be a little inbuilt video, but it's not working. Good. Okay. Uh, so this was, uh, you can download this from the, from the website. It's a fantastic little animation that shows you the increase in the number of genome-wide significant variants um, uh, over time. Um, and as an experimental design, it's done, it's delivered, I think, exactly what it was set out to do, which is uh, to um, uh, detect uh, robust associations between particular DNA, common DNA variants and, and disease and other traits. So some general conclusions, and these are biased towards my view of the, of the field, but some general conclusions about GWAS. If, if, we see, if we take the starting point in 2007 and we go on to today, uh, first I think most people would agree with that common traits and diseases are highly polygenic. There are many, many loci uh, that are segregating in, in the human um, uh, genome uh, that contribute to, to risk or, or, or trait differences. I think all traits are common, uh, sorry, are uh, complex, by which uh, I mean that even some traits that people previously thought were, were almost monogenic, you can also find additional common variation underlying those. By, so as a consequence of the polygenicity, the genetic effect sizes tend to be very, very small. So that just means we need larger effect sizes to, to detect them. Pleiotropy, mentioned earlier today, is the norm rather than the exception, I think, and it just means that we find genetic correlations in a, in a systematic way that if you're high for one trait, you're also high or, or, or on average lower genetically for another trait. And also, you know, for disease, if you're interested in studying common disease, it's clearly not an individual locus that, mat that, that matters in terms of your risk. It's the cumulative effect of many risk alleles in a person that determines their risk. And finally, and this, this leads uh, me into the topic of genetic architecture, uh, what's been observed from GWAS is that alleles that have larger effect sizes and that are, that are associated with a trait or, or, or with disease tend to be at lower frequency in the population. So let's speculate a little bit before we go on to measure or to estimate genetic variance. Let's, let's speculate a bit about what we can learn about, uh, what we can uh, propose about heritability and genetic architecture. So first of all, the relationship between the segregating variants in the population, the effect size at these variants and their frequency, and that sometimes that joint distribution is sometimes called genetic architecture, is actually determined by things that happened in our past, in, our, uh, in the evolutionary past. Mutations, drift, and natural selection. But because GWAS is actually, um, uh, as I said, the scientific basis of GWAS is linkage to equilibrium, and you can only have strong correlations between things that you observe, SNPs, um, and or impute, and, uh, and unknown causal variants Correlations that are high, you can only observe them when they're high, when, when the LD is high, and when they have similar allele frequencies. For example, alleles, causal variants in the population that are low, at low frequency, 
are not highly correlated with common variants. So the success of GWAS actually depends on what the genetic architecture is. And again, we can turn this around by saying, okay, let's use or utilize or exploit the results that we have seen from GWAS to make some inference about genetic architecture. And this is just a final comment, uh, which is also to do with genetic architecture about polygenic prediction. So polygenic prediction depends on two things, and you need both of them to, to, to get a very accurate predictor. First of all, how much of your technology that you use, for example, SNP arrays versus, um, uh, versus whole genome sequencing, for example, how much of the total genetic variance does it capture? But secondly, how, how well are the individual effect sizes estimated with the, in terms of with how much error? So let's, uh, let's uh, uh, return then to uh, the estimation of genetic uh, variation in a population or heritability. Um, Fisher showed that you can estimate genetic variance without knowing anything about individual mutations. And, and indeed, if you estimate genetic variance from pedigree data, it's completely blind to genetic architecture. And the reason for that is it's based upon probabilities of sharing genes identical by descent, which doesn't depend on how common those, uh, the variants are in the population. From GWAS, because it depends on, on uh, as, as we saw, on, on Linkus's equilibrium, it really depends on how much genetic variance is captured by, uh, by SNPs. And that's essentially, you know, Linkus's equilibrium between whatever's causing the genetic variation in a population and the, and the genetic variance that we assay through a SNP chip or, 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 um, or, or, or um, whole genome sequence, for example. We can speculate before we actually look at empirical data what a genetic architecture should look like. And, and here's some theoretical uh, predictions using some very simple models. Uh, at least the simplest one I could think of is a neutral model. So the mutations arise in the population and they have no effect whatsoever on fitness. And I'm also assuming to make it even simpler that we have a population of, of uh, constant effective population size. Uh, although this is very simple, it makes an interesting prediction which could be a null model that we can test against. First of all, this simple model predicts that most of the causal variants that would be segregated segregating in the population are actually rare. And this is just dynamics of, uh, of mutation ar uh, arising and, um, um, and drifting. However, if we are interested in explaining variation in the population as a function here of, of minor allele frequency, we see it's actually linear cumulatively in, in, uh, in minor allele frequency. So that means, for example, that 20% of heritability under this simple model would um, be contributed by causal variance with a frequency of 10% or less. Yeah, that's this point over here. What natural selection does is take this line on the diagonal here and push it to the left. And that was modeled, as, there's many models in the literature, and I just picked out one, which is from Adam A. Walker from a number of years ago, uh, where he modeled the relationship uh, between the effects on the trait and, and fitness in, with this parameter here. And all you need to know is that the larger this number is, the more closely the trait is, is actually uh, equal to fitness. And, and as you can see, depending on how you model this, you see this curvature away from the diagonal here. So all, you know, for, for the time being, what this basically means is that among causal variants, uh, with a frequency of less percent, they would contribute more than 20% of heritability, as opposed to the neutral model here. So in 2009 or so, we were, we were uh, you know, observing the initial results from GWAS, and we thought, well, clearly GWAS, your success of GWAS is determined by your sample size. Is there a way we can get around that and try to estimate the amount of genetic variation that's captured by all SNPs, uh, considering all SNPs simultaneously. And, and, and what we came up with at that time was a very simple model. Let's, let's just think of a model where we have our trait, and here are the SNPs. So, so here we can think about it like we have, we have 
hundreds of thousands of SNPs and all of them have some effect on the trade. So this is just a linear regression or a regression model, I should say, uh, with X, you know, your SNP dosage and beta some effect sizes. We then said, okay, let's now standardize our, um, our SNPs by um, centering them. This is the expectation, 2P is the frequency, is the expectation of X here. And this is a standard deviation under, under the assumption of what's called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And let's now assume, and this is a big assumption, let's now assume that these um, effects here of these standardized uh, genotypes uh, are from a normal distribution with some variance here. So what that means is that if we just write the variance in our observation, so it now becomes a random effects model, is just equal by, by going through its sums here, a w, w prime times this, times this sigma squared u plus some residual. Okay, so what? Well, let's now write our, um, our, this uh, sum here. So for each individual in, a, in our sample, this is just a sum of the scaled effects at the causal variance, okay? So, and we call this, this g, and because of this assumption here that all the SNPs have an effect which are uh, independent of each other, we have that the genetic variance now, so the variance between people, between individuals, it's just m times our variance at an individual, individual variant. So we can write out the, the, the model now as y equals g plus e, and we have the variance of y, which, is, uh, which I call uh, a, a matrix called g, which is just per definition, because of, 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 the defin uh, of the definition of G here, it's just, as you can see here, is sigma squared, uh, is W, W prime uh, divided by the number of variance. So what actually does that mean? I've turned my model, which is in terms of the number of SNPs here, where we have, for example, hundreds of thousands of these, I've turned that into a model in terms of the number of individuals, yeah, in terms of N. So what that means is that under these assumptions, we have an equivalence, a statistical equivalence, that a model with individual genome-wide uh, additive value, that's the one on the right, using relationships, because this, this is what this G matrix is, at the causal variance is equivalent to a model where we can, it's almost like a linear regression, multiple regression model. The only additional assumption is to be able to estimate the effects is that they're, they're, that they're random effects drawn from this distribution here. And the nice thing about this framework is we can use the standard machinery for mixed models uh, to estimate these variance components. Now, of course, this is a very simplistic model and it makes lots of assumptions. For example, the model is per definition defi defined here in terms of causal variance. And of course, we don't know the causal variance. But the nice thing is if you apply this to SNPs and you make the same assumptions and you can create the, sa the same matrix, it it's telling you what, how much genetic variance is uh, captured by fitting all these SNPs simultaneously in the model. There are, have been many, many uh, uh, criticisms on this model, and, and there are definitely a number of valid criticisms. One of them, of course, is to saying, okay, this is very unrealistic. We assume that all these SNPs that you have, uh, that you have measured have, have some effect on the trait, uh, and, and, and that's uh, unrealistic, even if it could be a good approximation. The second one uh, is that we are essentially weighting these effects here, as you, as you can see over here. We're doing this scaling, and, and we are doing this scaling in, an, in uh, what we can call a hard-coded way. We apply that sort of standardly. Um, and, and thirdly, a criticism would be that we assume that all the SNPs are drawn from a single distribution with some variance. And that would preclude, for example, the idea that you have some effects that are really, really big, even when standardized, and others that are really, really tiny that don't come from the same distribution. There have been a number of, of, uh, of refinements or additions to this uh, model proposed by uh, not just us, but other people as well. One of them is to use the same linear model framework to partition the variation in, in underlying uh, potential sources. For example, you can partition uh, your model in, uh, you can annotate SNPs according to their frequency, linkages equilibrium, 
you may have some other genome annotation where you would uh, uh, that you would partition the, the SNPs into, and it just comes back to a model where you now have instead of a single genetic uh, random effect of which you want to estimate the variance, you have many of them. And the second, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, thing you can do is to say because this was initially just uh, done for genotyped uh, SNPs on, on a particular SNP array, uh, you can also use in, uh, variants that are imputed to a fully sequenced reference to see how much additional uh, uh, variation do you capture by, uh, by doing that. But let's go back to this particular, to this initial observation, this observation from GWAS across many traits and diseases that there is a relationship that you can observe between the effect size and the allele frequency. And the question is, can we model this directly? And this was first uh, suggested by Doug Speed, who I think I just noticed in the audience here somewhere. So, so here is one way to put it in the, in the model as a parameter. So we now have our effects at individual loci. It's again from a normal distribution but the variance of that particular variant depends on the frequency or how common it is. And we've just modeled it as, uh, as this whole thing to a parameter uh, which we called S. Uh, uh, it's important if we knew what this parameter was because it makes a prediction on the cumulative contribution of variance, of individual variance to the total genetic variance in the population. So we go back to one of the equations I showed before. The contribution to heritability of an individual locus is a, is a combination of the heterozygosity at that locus and its effect size. So if we fill in the expected value of the effect size squared, which of course is the variance, we come up with this, with this equation here. What does this mean? Let's, let's, let's put, on, put in some extreme values here. If we put S as zero, then uh, this just becomes to the power, yeah, this is zero, so this becomes just 2p times 1 minus p times sigma squared b. That's essentially going back to our neutral model that I showed you uh, earlier about genetic architecture. So what that actually means is that most variance um, in the population, most variation is contributed by common variance. Another extreme, and that's our hard-coded extreme that we used right from the start, is S equals minus 1. And that actually is consistent with the assumption that all variants that are segregating explain exactly the same amount of variation. In other words, those loci that are segregating at lower frequency uh, have a bigger effect size and it exactly compensates for the relationship between the effect size and, the, and, and frequency that you're getting the same contribution uh, of, of variation in, in uh, uh, variation to sorry same contribution to phenotypic variation and, and to heritability. So we actually implemented this in a in a Bayesian framework using the first phase of the UK Bauer Bank uh, data, and 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 here across a bunch of traits you, you don't need to read this it doesn't really matter there's a whole bunch of traits we looked at but I just wanted to show you the here is the uh, cumulative variance explained of the, ver of the, of the genetic vari variation that we, that we capture, and here's the minor allele frequency. And as you can see, for all these traits, there's a departure from the diagonal, which is consistent with some action of natural selection, which I said pushes that cumulative variance distribution away from the line y equals x. When we... Uh, estimated this parameter S across these traits, uh, the average was roughly speaking minus a half. So this is not as extreme as the minus one that we assumed right from the start, right? Um, so it's saying, yes, there's evidence for natural selection, but it's not so strong that every variant or consistent with a, a model where every variant that that segregates in the population has, contributes exactly the same amount of genetic variation. So as a complete aside, uh, imagine that we want to GWAS by whole genome sequencing and we assume that this model of, of this relationship between effect size and allele frequency extrapolates to all, to all the rare variants. Yeah? 
and everything else being the same. So I'm going to test one, mar one snip at a time and I'm going to either do a case control frequency difference uh, comparison or some uh, linear uh, correlation between our traits. If S equals minus a half, and I compare, then I can compare what is the extra power that you would need, or extra samples that you would need, to detect a rare variant by association, everything else being the same. And, and, and so I have to assume this, this, this relationship here. And it comes out to be, if you do the sums, and the sums are shown at the bottom here, some function which is inversely proportional to the square of the, of the rare uh, 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 allele frequency. So for example, everything else being the same, under these assumptions you'd need five times the sample size to detect a variant that's segregating at 1% versus one that's segregating um, at 50% um, uh, on average and, and 15 times for an even rarer variant. I know there's a lot of assumptions here. I just wanted to point out, just because you have a whole genome sequence, that doesn't mean that suddenly you find lots of associations. There have been, so I don't want you to go home with the idea that all these developments have been done uh, in our group, for example. Uh, there have been a tremendous number of methodolo methodological developments in the last decade to estimate genetic variants. And in fact, many of the people have contributed there are in this audience and I didn't want to put lots of references down because I thought I'm bound to forget one or not uh, attribute it to, his, uh, to an in, uh, a specific group or individual. But try to ca uh, categorize these developments. They, they come in a number of different flavors. Uh, one of them is to use SNP data in a, uh, in a familial context to exploit and estimate the segregation variants within, within families and then to, to use that to estimate genetic, um, uh, genetic uh, variation. And this was, for example, most recently done by um, uh, Alex Young in a paper in Nature Genetics last year using data from DECODE um, where they exploited this. Uh, a second one is to get away from this model of a single distribution of... Um, uh, um, of, of um, uh, variants uh, for, for causal variants uh, and, and, and use more uh, you know, non-infinitesimal priors to estimate genetic variation. And, 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 and really the third one and, and a very important one is actually to estimate genetic variation not from individual level data but to exploit all the GWAS summary statistics that are out there. And the trick there is for most methods is to use a reference sample to approximate the correlation structure uh, between, uh, between markers in the genome, uh, which you can do because it's a population uh, kind of parameter, the, the, the LD matrix. Um, just some general comments about how to link also the estimation of individual SNP effects and, genetic, and estimating of genetic variation. And I put it to you that the best method to estimate genetic var variation should actually also be the best method to estimate SNP effects. Yeah, for GWAS or for discovery. And to me that suggests we need to use random effect models, use Bayesian inference, and create estimates of the effects that are unbiased in, an un in, in not in the sense of least square regression, but in a, in a, in a random effect sense. In, and, and, that, and that's shown here. This is saying that if under a random effects model, that the expectation of the true effect given our estimated effect should be the true effect. So you can think about it as conceptually that the regression of the true effects on our estimated effect should have a slope of one. And, and then the best estimate in the random effect sense uh, of a particular SNP effect would be its expectation given the data. So expectation of UY, and, and, and here in the Bayesian framework where we, you can integrate over that and, and you can turn this around using Bayes' theorem by having a prior distribution on, on, the, on, the, on the effect sizes. And when it comes to polygenic prediction, it's exactly the same, that the best model to estimate SNP effects should actually give you the highest prediction accuracy in a new sample. It's all the same thing. We tried to make that point a few years ago in, in, in this paper here. It was published in PLOS Genetics. 
we said that using this kind of methodology, random effects methodology, methodology you could simultaneously do discovery, estimation, and prediction analysis. And more recently, this is a bioarchive paper, and um, you might find it hard to read, but this is out of sample prediction for height in two different studies. And I just want to point you, forget about what all these different bars are, but basically the prediction R squared, so that is fitting um, phenotypes um, and regressing them against their genetic predictors, their PRS for height, explain more than 30% of, of uh, variation in complete out-of-sample uh, prediction, which is pretty high. I'd like to end just a few minutes uh, talking about prediction and just go, going over uh, again, focusing on height. First of all, height is actually also a complex trait in the sense that there are Mendelian forms or pseudo-Mendelian forms of height, uh, which are very rare in the population, but most variation we know now is consistent with, with polygenic variation, with many, many loci segregating in the human genome. If I take a snapshot, this is already a year old and therefore uh, a year out of date, and we look at the partition of, partitioning of genetic variation for height as an example of a complex trait. We have 100%, which is our phenotypic variation that we can observe in the population. Twin and family studies suggest or are consistent with that the majority of this um, is due to uh, is genetics, so that's the, the pedigree heritability. And remember, Galton uh, suggested it was about two-thirds from his data. Uh, if we look at the genome-wide significant effects, at least of, uh, from last year, which was a paper from the, uh, from the GIANT consortium, identified more than 3,000 variants in the genome that, that, that uh, jointly had an effect. And they explain about these genome-wide significant variants, explain about 20% of the, va of the uh, variation. A SNP chip using genotype SNPs, about 45%. And if you add imputation, about 56 That's roughly where we are, where we were last year. As I said, this is already out of date. So let, let's see what happens when you do prediction, when your prediction is based upon uh, polygenic, risk, uh, polygenic risk scores, where the SNP effects are only used from genome-wide significant effects. I've just done that as an illustration here. So this is a paper from Mike Whedon from 2008. On the x-axis, we have uh, the number of tall alleles that people are, um, uh, were selected on. And on the y-axis, um, we, um, or, or this is the, the, the distribution of people who are in this category. So, of course, very, very few people at, at that stage had 30 increasing alleles. And then these are the actual heights of the individuals in, the, in, that, in, the, uh, in, in these groups over here. And you see a very nice linear relationship. And I just wanted to point out that at that time in 2008, that the top if you look at the top guys here, or top individuals here versus the bottom, the difference is in, in realized value is about six centimeters. So that's uh, just under three inches or so. What happens if you increase your sample size? Well, you find more loci that explain more variation, but you're also better to tease out the differences between the top and bottom. Or if you think about it for, for disease, for example, your odds ratios from your genetic predictor go up if you get more accurate predictors. So this is now from 2018. Uh, we can't put on this axis the number of increasing alleles because we had 3,000 loci and I wouldn't be able to show that. But this is just in, uh, in height, st in uh, uh, phenotypic standard deviations. And what I should have said before is the one way to think about this, uh, this plot here is one standard deviation of the polygenic risk score is equivalent to one centimeter here. Whereas uh, 10 years later, we now have a difference in outcome between the people in the top of the distribution and at the bottom, which has gone up to 15 centimeters. Yeah, two, more than two standard deviations, two standard deviations and one standard deviation of the, of the predictor is now three, uh, gone up from one to three centimeters. And if we somehow were able to identify all variants um, that um, contribute to height variation, uh, theoretically, and if the heritability is 
theoretically the top uh, the difference between the top and bottom would be about 25 centimeters or 10 inches or so and my final slide is about my prediction or where prediction on height is going next year okay and i just want to go all the way back to uh, to galton in 1886 uh, because you can use the parental average to predict the height of uh, offspring and you can actually think about that as a, a prediction using family history just a parent average okay and what if for a quantitative trait that's quite 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 easy. And in a cheeky paper from my friend Yuri Olchenko uh, in 2009, he at that time contrasted the prediction of height using Victorian methods, so that's Galton, uh, and contrasted that with uh, how well a SNP predictor at that time did. And as I've shown you, a SNP predictor at that time wasn't as good as it is now. So theoretically, if uh, we use the parent, parent average and we have that information on family history, and if all the resemblance between parents and offspring is due to genetics, then the maximum R squared value we get from, from out of sample prediction or from prediction, sorry, should be a half to the heritability squared. So that's 0 0.32. So my prediction is that by 2020, and maybe by the end of this year, or maybe it's already out there that SNP-based pr uh, predictors were already outperformed the family history. And this is quite interesting because when you, when you think about it, this was in the, in the 10 years ago, it was the idea, oh, GWAS doesn't work and, and hasn't worked. And now suddenly everybody's excited about polygenic predictors. And it's just because of the increase in sample size, we're getting a much better handle and identifying groups of people at a very high risk in the population or who we predict to be very tall, if you see that as an analogy. Um, and as I showed you already, using, for example, the UK Biobank data as a discovery, we can go make a predictor using more sophisticated Bayesian methods, go to the Estonia Biobank and predict height already with an R squared of more than 30%. By next year, I think the giant consortium will probably have um, uh, um, have dealt with their, uh, what we're currently doing, which is discovery sample sizes of the order of 4 million. And I'm very confident that we're going to do better than family history for height, as an example. With that, I'd like to uh, end by thanking actually all uh, our entire group, in particular Naomi and Jiang Yang, uh, who co-direct the program in uh, complex trade genomics at the University of uh, uh, Queensland. And, and as I said, uh, uh, we all like to see you there next year in June. Thank you.